too many Christians a complex about their Christian faith. Amen. In this post-Christian Reformation, the forces have been so domineering that there are many Christians walking around and they have a complex concerning their cherished Christian faith. So much to the point that they've been put in a shell and they are very fearful uh, to talk about their belief in Christ. They're very <laughs> fearful uh, of, you know, uh, taking a stand for uh, biblical truth. And they've been marginalized, neutralized in this culture in which we're living. And uh, this is why we're looking at our scripture today. I noticed the reality of this while attending a mayor clergy meeting here in Norwalk. Uh, the mayor asked that all, if all the clergy would introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their ministry. And being these guys were in a, you know, a governmental setting, uh, they basically, by automatic impulse, when they introduced themselves, they started characterizing their church for all the social good that they do. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I mean, it almost, as they went around and introduced themselves, it almost sounded like we were having a contest of which pastor could be the most humanitarian. And again, I appreciate that, but I thought to myself, man, it sure would be nice if some pastor would say, uh, I am pastor so-and-so with such-and-such -such church, and what we do is we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and seek to make disciples. Amen. <laughs> But that was not mentioned. And you say, well, why didn't you mention it, Pastor Tom? I wanted to so badly, but I was like the last guy, and I had heard so much hot air. I was like, if I, if I say something now, it will seem contentious, and I just don't want to do that. But next meeting, I promise you, I promise you, hold me to it. Next meeting, that's what I'll say. I am Pastor Tom, and I've been with the Community Baptist Church for 24 years, and what I do is preach the gospel and seek to make disciples. <laughs> <laughs> but beloved, this is not the time for any of us to have a complex about our Christian faith. Our society has a great need for us as Christians to exhibit calmness, confidence, and joy in our faith. That's what our society needs. Our society needs us to exhibit calmness, confidence, and joy concerning our faith. And if you need to see what that looks like, I'm so glad that in our Christmas cram, so many of you are reading the book of Acts. How many have done that? Amen. Remind me, Brother Kevin, I need to get your card to you. Don't leave without that. Okay. Uh, yeah, so many are reading the book of Acts, and that is our model of people who did not live in a Christian culture, and they were suffering, and the forces that be were trying to get them to do what the forces that be right now are succeeding in getting us to do, and that is uh, feel very insecure in our faith. But in the book of Acts, we see those apostles filled with the Holy Spirit, exhibiting everywhere they, they went calmness, confidence, and joy, right? Amen. So it's still not too late for you, still not too late for you in the Christmas cram to read the book of Acts. Come on, everybody, let's do, let's do the Christmas cram. You're not going to join me in that? <laughs> One more time. Come on, everybody, let's do, let's do the Christmas crown. All right. Last time, I promise, we won't do that ever again. Never, never again. Well, in this need for us to be that kind of Christian, it can be that way. It can be that way, but this is what we have to do. We cannot fixate over what a post-Christian culture thinks about us. We cannot do that. We have to stop fixating on what our culture thinks about us because it is a post-Christian culture 
It's a no-win for us. But rather, we need to focus on what God wants to do through us in the culture in which we're living. Don't worry about what they think about us. Get excited about what God wants to do through us in this culture. That's what it's all about. That's the way it needs to be. This is the very thing that steadied the Apostle Paul. And like I say, he was not in a post-Christian culture, but his uh, circumstances were very similar in that he was in a, what kind of culture? Pre-Christian culture, right? When you're the first missionary ever sent, what that means is you are going into a pre-Christian culture. Now, if you wanted me to pick which would be the lesser evil, I would say we are on the lesser evil. I feel so sorry for the Apostle Paul doing what he had to do. I would rather live in a post-Christian culture than a pre. And you're talking about a guy who was a preemie baby, six weeks preemie, but I'd rather live in post than pre. All right? So this is what steadied Paul, and we want to look at uh, his take on it all, and that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 14 through 17. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. So this is just a little example of how the Apostle Paul uh, felt about what he was doing in his culture. And we want to unpack these verses this morning. Let's look at the first part of verse number 14. Paul says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Alright, there's a guy functioning in a pre-Christian culture and he says that God causes me to always always triumph in Christ. Now I'm excited to talk about this verse because I don't believe I ever have brought this up to you. But put your index finger under that word triumph. In his language, when Paul said to triumph in Christ, what he was doing was he was giving a wonderful, a wonderful picture of something that related to his times. Remember, Paul lived in the Roman Empire, right? And so... This, use, this word triumph is not a general use of the word like you would use it. He had something very specific in mind with the culture that he lived in, which was the Roman Greco culture. So what Paul is doing by intentionally using this word triumph is he is alluding to what we know as historically the Roman triumph. And this is pretty much universally understood by everybody that interprets this passage, so much so that if we were to look at the English Standard Version, the first part of verse number 14 would read like this, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in what? Triumphal procession. Triumphal procession. So Paul is talking about what we know as the Roman triumph, which was a triumphal procession for victorious generals who had won huge battles for the Roman Empire. 
Yeah, uh, the Roman triumph was a special tribute that Rome gave to their generals who were victorious in battles. They went off to battle, they did heroic things, they accomplished much for the empire, so in appreciation they were allowed to come back to the city of Rome and there would be scheduled this special procession. It would be equivalent to our American ticker tape parade. Remember when the Rams won the Super Bowl last year? What did they do afterwards? They closed off the streets and they had a big parade. Did any of you go? Well, none of us are going this year, I promise you. <laughs> Did you get that? Miss Feather got that. She comes from a lineage of Rams fans. I'm sorry, sister. So, it was a really big deal. It wasn't just for any victory won. There was a criteria if you were going to have a Roman triumph in your honor. There was a, a, a big demands. If you were one of those generals, what you would have to do is when you went off to war, you would have had to uh, cause the demise of at least 5,000 enemy soldiers. And not only was it to win roundly like that in the, the warfare, but what you would also have to do, you would have had to gain new territory for the emperor. So we're talking about that kind of victory. We're talking about um, a pummeling of the enemies of the Roman Empire. At least 5,000 enemy soldiers taken down and new ter territory gained for the emperor. So what would happen is they would take this procession through uh, the city of Rome, like I say, like our ticker tape parades, that would kind of be something you could have in your mind, and it would be a huge deal. It would be a huge deal. Uh, the procession would include the victorious general riding in a golden chariot. He would be surrounded by his officers. The parade would also include a display of the spoils that he had brought back to Rome from the defeated territory. I mean, there would be golden coins, there would be the armor of soldiers uh, that uh, they had taken of the enemy soldiers. I mean, think about a parade and the people would get to see the display of all the spoil. Now, if it was a very prosperous country that was defeated, uh, it would take a number of days to show all that they came back with. But for, for this part, uh, they were allowed to see uh, some of the, the, the precious spoils that were taken in the war. And then um, also uh, what would happen was the enemy soldiers that were taken prisoner would be marched in that parade. They would be all shackled, they would be humiliated, and they would be marched through the city. And the only problem for them is they were, some of them would be marching to uh, becoming slaves, but many of them would be marching to what? <laughs> to an execution. They would be brought to the end of the procession, which was the Circus Maximus, big Colosseum, and some of those uh, enemy prisoners would be sent out to fight with the wild beasts and be killed by the wild beasts for the entertainment of the Roman people. Others would simply be executed. So keep that in mind as we go on with Paul's verses. But is everybody getting the picture of this? Another thing to keep in mind as we go on with the verses as Paul sets forth this imagery and he's likening it to the victory that we have as Christians. Um, keep in mind that also what happened during this parade is Roman priests would uh, be carrying around incense to pay tribute to their victorious army. So think about many priests and along the whole parade route would be this incense diffusing from the priests. And I think, you know, I started wondering about that. 
um, the use of incense and all the fragrance, the nice smelling fragrance of incense and also flowers, garlands of laurel that was, was in the parade, decorating the parade. And I thought probably also those victorious soldiers that were marching uh, in the procession, uh, they probably didn't smell too good after all that travel and war. So this was probably not only to pay tribute to them, but to subdue their um, body armor odor. <laughs> right, Brother Mark? Yes. Body armor or odor. Okay? Um, now, if, if, if this captivates you as it did me, because I'm a Bible nerd, if you want to learn more about the Rome, Roman triumph, just go on YouTube and type in Roman triumph. And you can see like a nine minute presentation and maybe it'll just be like me looking at your screen. <laughs> it's really cool. But with that being said, we know what Paul is doing by the unique use of that word triumph. He is not using it generally. He is trying to give you and me as believers in Jesus Christ a picture. A picture of victory. And so that's why he says, we already read in verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always uh, causes us to triumph in Christ, in, in Christ, or thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and makes manifest the savor or fragrance of his knowledge by us in every place. What is the Apostle Paul doing here in this imagery? He's talking about the incense bearers. In that triumphal procession, there were the incense bearers that gave off that wonderful fragrance. So in the picture, he says, and makes manifest the savor or the fragrance or the smell of his knowledge by whom? By us in every place. So we as Christians, we are a part of the triumphal procession and what we get to do in all of this victory is we get to dis diffuse the knowledge of God as an incense to our culture. It's a victory, the battle's been won, who is that general in the golden chariot? The Lord Jesus. And what are we? We are like his, the, the priests who get to go along in the procession and make known the knowledge of God in every place. So what Paul is saying is our geography is not limited. Everywhere we go, we get to diffuse incense to the culture which is us bringing to our culture the knowledge of whom? The knowledge of God and Christ in every place. This is exactly again what the newer translations show us. Uh, the, the English Standard Version uh, in uh, harmony with uh, our verse that we just read, uh, the latter part of verse 14 says this, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. In Tiendi Miguel. So with that being said, uh, everything is set for our appreciation for the rest of the text, but as we go on uh, to the next uh, verses, Let's go ahead and look down in our Bible now that we have all this understanding and read verse 14 out loud together one more time. Let's take this in in its full context. Let's go. Now thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. So from this verse I want you to take away a fact and I want you to own it for the rest of your life. 
As we just read verse number 14 and we got the historical context and what Paul was trying to do in the use of his language, we come away with a fact for you and me that we need to use, that we need to own, that we need to never forget because the forces of our culture are trying to give you a complex about your Christianity and what you need to do to push back against those forces and what they're trying to do by putting you in a shell is you need to re remember this. We do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. Everybody say that uh, out loud. We do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. The victory has already been won and that's why you are a part of this triumphal procession. This is why Paul says Christ always leads us in triumphal procession because he in the picture is that victorious general. Amen. And that's why there are other verses that allude to this also, this, this, uh, this Roman triumph, Paul uses it in his epistles. Consider Colossians 2.15. What does Colossians 2.15 say? Concerning Jesus Christ, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. What is the Bible telling us in this verse? The Bible is telling us that the Lord Jesus Christ has even subdued principalities and powers. Jesus Christ, through the victory of his cross, has already subdued demonic forces. So much so that if we could have seen his procession back to heaven, the angels in heaven saw Christ leading demonic fallen angels uh, as the prisoners, as the captives, who no longer will be able to be um, warring and defeating um, his kingdom. Many, many demons have been disarmed, and Christ uh, made a public spectacle of them somewhere. It was seen triumphing over them in it, again using that word triumph. Does everybody see that? And he alludes to this also in Ephesians 4.8. So Colossians 2.15 is a picture of the enemy prisoners, the demons. Ephesians 4.8 is a picture of the spoil that our victorious general has won for our kingdom. Uh, Ephesians 4.8, therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. And in that victory, he gave gifts to men. What is our gift? Our gift is we have the authority everywhere we go to be in a triumphal procession. We have the authority in our gifts to speak forth the truth of Christ everywhere we go. And we have the authority to be priests uh, in behalf of of our victorious general so we are carrying around incense and everywhere we go we get to make the fragrance of Christ known experienced and that fragrance is indi in indicative of the fact that he has already won the victory and we are in this procession Amen. so it's kind of a spiritual application how many are following this so far Amen. How many are starting to have that complex fade a little? <laughs> All right, so now let's go to verse number 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. We are unto God a sweet fragrance, sweet aroma, sweet perfume of Christ to God. Do you understand how God sees you? It doesn't matter how this post-Christian world sees us. They see us as the baddies. 
The very fact that we um, are in submissive to this truth of the Word of God, we automatically become the baddies. But we have to show that even though they think that about us, we are to God, and that's all that matters, we are to God a sweet perfume. Amen. He looks at us living in this time, and he rejoices in us that we are his incense bearers. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. So I don't know about you, but I feel pretty confident uh, no matter what anybody else says about me. If I'm serving God, if I'm faithful to God, if I am uh, making manifest His Word, I realize every time I do that, anywhere I go, that I am a Christ-like fragrance raising up, rising up to my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. And in spreading the fragrance of Christ, we ourselves become, as Paul said here in this verse, fragrant. So, verse number 15, for we are unto God a sweet savor, a sweet aroma of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. The explanation here in verse 16, to the one we are the fragrance of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. Now, why does Paul talk like that? Well, remember in this procession, there were two sets of soldiers uh, walking in that perception. There were the general soldiers who were victorious, and now they have come home from that battle, and the very fact that they're allowed to enter into the city of Rome as a soldier means that they get to retire. They retire in victory. So as they go through this processional route, as they start to come to the entrance of the city and they smell that perfume, it is a smell of life to them. I'm victorious with my general. We're going into this procession as the victors, and I have life. More life than ever before because I get to retire. But then there was another set of soldiers. They were the prisoners. And even though that perfume was so beautiful, that incense was so aromatic, when they smelled it, do you think they really enjoyed the beauty of the smell? The fact that they smelled incense, the fact that they knew that they were entering into a Roman triumph means that they were defeated and that smell indicated to them that they were going to die. They were being led to the end of the parade route, to the Circus Maximus, and there would be their ultimate judgment. They would either be led into the Colosseum to fight with wild beasts and be destroyed there, or they would be roundly executed. So you can see it's the same smell, it's beautiful, but to one set of soldiers, it's life. To the other set of soldiers, that aroma meant death. And that's how we work in our life as Christians. We can't control how the word is going to sit with this person or that person, but we know for sure that if, if they don't believe it, if they continue to be an enemy of God and do not get reconciled to God by trusting Christ and obeying the gospel, then ultimately, even though we give such precious aroma in our words, our words are fragrance, the fragrance of Christ, ultimately it will mean their death. But it's not on us. It's not on them. It's, it's on them. And uh, we should have nothing but confidence. As the Roman priests burned the incense in the parade, that odor affected different people in different ways. Did everybody get that in the picture? Yes. Did you get it or are you thinking about going to the Walmart after service? <laughs> Come on now, I'm talking about victory. Amen. You guys are looking at me like the Grinch and stole Christmas. I'm starting to 
get ready to split from Whoville here. Getting a little uncanny. No. Uh, to the triumphant soldiers, as I said, it meant life and victory, but to the conquered enemy, it meant defeat and death. Which leads us to the second part of verse number 16. And who is sufficient for these things? Verse 17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. That's us. We realize that the victory is through Jesus. We're not sufficient for these things. All we need to do is take our place in that uh, victory processional. All we have to do by faith is know that we are in this triumphal procession everywhere we go. We walk in victory. And so for us, it, we don't worry about anything. The victory is in Christ, so we don't have to corrupt the Word of God and, and uh, you know, use our own genius and our own uh, gifts and talents to try and uh, make people you know, follow us. No, our MO is of sincerity as of God in the sight of God. So that's how we roll in this procession. It's always sincerity. It's always of God. And again, it is in the sight of God. What we do is not primarily for our culture. What we do in our culture is always for God in His sight. Amen. We're not worried about what others think about us. We're worried about how God sees us. We're, we're uh, excited about what God wants to do through us. And that is be a part of this procession and bear the incense. Warren Wiersbe says this concerning this passage. We don't have to fail. Circumstances may discourage us and people may oppose us and misunderstand us, but we have in Christ the spiritual resources to win the battle. Just like what Paul said in, in a parallel of that, we have a clear conscience, a compassionate heart, and a conquering faith. And so this is the second truth that I want us to take away today from this passage. The first truth I said that we have to know to overcome the complex that the world is trying to force on us right now, the thing we have to know is we do not fight for victory, we fight the second thing we need to know in this passage as, uh, as Paul talks to us about these things is just like he says in the end of verse number 16 and who is sufficient for these things then he goes on and says in verse number 17 uh, we're not sufficient but what we do is of sincerity and it's of God and it's all in the sight of God that we speak in Christ so it's all for God and so this is the second truth we need to take away. We cannot do it without him, but he has decided not to do it without us. So let that be a shot in your arm. You say, I really wish we didn't have to live in times like this, Pastor Tom. I wish we could go back to the good old days. Oh, really? You need to study those good old days. The good old days were never really all that good. Like we're talking about when, Christ, when America was a Christian nation. Do you know it was also an America in two world wars when we were a Christian nation? Do you know it was also America that went through the, the, the Great Depression? They were good old days, but they weren't that good. So embrace. Embrace what you're living in. You are not living in a Christian America. You are living in a post-Christian America. But God has put you here because he's decided that what he wants to do, he wants to do through you. Amen. And we can't do it without God, but he has decided not to do it without us. Amen. So let the incense roll.
Let the procession continue. Everywhere we go, we are still in the triumphal procession. And boy, I needed this for last week. I was just minding my own business, checking out the church Facebook page, and I got a notification that someone had posted a picture of our church sign. And you know how naive I am. I got excited. I was like, oh, great, free public relations. Somebody got excited about our sign message, and they posted it on their social media. And so I was like, I got to see, I got to see this PR and tell the church all about it. To my horror, I clicked on and this post was from a very, very wicked atheist young lady. And she took our message and posted a picture of it and began to turn our message into something terribly crude. And all of her atheist friends jumped on board with that. And as I read their comments, I literally got sick at my stomach. Mm -hmm. And Elise happened to be there. And you know her. She's my guardian angel. She said, Dad, don't respond. I was like, who, me? <laughs> <laughs> and so I began just to silently pray to the Lord because I really wanted to respond. I had about 15 things that I was ready to type. I would have filled up her wall, boy. But I didn't respond. And I was glad that Elise exhorted me that way. Thank you, honey. I appreciate that. My guardian angel. But I thought it was over with. Because I didn't respond, I thought that I had peace. But you know what? It was in my head all week and it made me sick. I couldn't get it out of my head. It was so profane. So Friday came, and it's time to put up a new sign message, and I was like, oh man, I don't even feel like doing this. And I said, what, what can I do after that? And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put up the Word of God on both sides. So on the southwest side, I put up 1 Timothy 1.15, read it with me. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. On the northeast side, I put up 1 John 4.14. Read it with me. The Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. But I have to admit, after that atheist gal smacked me down like that, I was feeling a complex. But I said, I still need to be incensed for my church. This is for God. I don't care what they think about our sign. I went out there with that ladder. I put this, those messages up. I said, this is for God. The Word of God to our community for Him. This is our incense. We've been here for 70 years. We have the right to burn our incense on our property. Amen? Amen. And as I started to put up, I was like, oh, this, this smells pretty good. I'm enjoying this. And while I was putting it up, two patrol cars had their sirens blaring, and they turned left <coughs> and along the boulevard down uh, Norrock Boulevard, and I was watching, and I was like, Hey, I think they're turning in our lot. And I watched, and they were turning in our lot. And I thought, oh no, they're coming after me. <laughs> that atheist woman has called the police on me. I started to get shaky on the ladder. I said, you know what? I'll let the police do their business. I'll do mine. I'm a priest. i got to get this incense up. So I just kept working working, and more and more cars came. Before I knew it, there was 15, 20 cars there. And I was like, well, maybe I ought to go down and kind of find out what's going on and get some more letters to put up. And so they came over to me and they said, we've got a situation going on. Uh, we're hoping it's okay. We can use your church. I, we can't tell you the details now, but, you know, we really need to, to use your property to, to stage. And I was like, okay, you know, anything I can do to help. So after that, they wanted for me to open up the restrooms for them, and I did that. After that, they needed uh, the use of electricity for laptops, and so I did that. And uh, all of a sudden, more and more cars came in, and then swap vehicles. And it ended up where I had to call Josh and his mom to come take over for me because... They ended up being on our church property till 2.30 in the morning on Saturday morning. 
And what it was, right down the street here, there was a hold-up situation where a man was served a warrant and he was threatening to kill his family and kill any uh, sheriff deputy that came to his house. So it was that kind of situation. And um, as I went home, everything changed with me. Now all of a sudden I felt so dejected about our church sign and how the community took it. And I realized that with 1 Timothy 1.15 and 1 John 4.14, that about 50 sheriff's deputies got to stand out here all night long and read the Word of God. Amen. <laughs> and that's, pardon me? They should help you. The yes, I agree. But they didn't. <laughs> and that's the way it works. We always have the victory. Amen. We always have the victory in Christ. So listen, we're ready to wrap up here, but you need to understand, you need to accept this, you need to embrace this, you need to own this. There is nothing our society needs more right now than for you to walk in victory. Amen. Walk in victory according to 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17. That is, that is your authority for victory right there. And there's nothing that society needs more. And my question is to you, will you be that Christian who God can count on to burn your incense and steal the tide of this we evil post-Christian culture that we're dealing in? I hope you'll stay after today for my short presentation on neighborhood evangelism. Because I want you to be that Christian that God can count on. I want verse number 17 to be your New Year's resolution. As of sincerity, as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. The only way we can be the priests in this procession of victory is by sharing the word of God. We need to be a soul winning church. That's the only thing we have left. That's the only thing we can help our society in is be a soul winning church. And so I hope you'll stay after today and uh, become a part of the solution rather than the problem. Uh, please stand. Will you be that Christian who exhibits calmness, confidence, and joy in your faith? As Paul explained, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Did you get to read it yet in, in this translation? I don't think you did. Read it with me again. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Let's bow our heads. Father, we are in your sight. Your word made that clear to us today. And Lord, it is such an assurance, it is such a comfort to know that we're in this only for you and that you...